Our next set of conflicts of interest, we're going to talk about the ones where it doesn't matter if your client actually consents to the representation. And um, this is a counterintuitive, this would be hard for non-lawyers to understand. And if for law students, you need to be aware that most of the time, if you have a conflict of interest, if both of the clients, let's say, are informed and consent to it, then you can proceed with the representation. We have a few extreme situations, of course, where it doesn't matter if they both want the same lawyer um, and they're both uh, willing to sign off on it and put it in writing that they wanna share a lawyer, like let's say opposing parties or something want to, both are used to using the same lawyer, where we're going to prohibit it. And so the ABA in the model rules has two different types of terms that they um, use for this, two terms. One is they, they'll call it prohibited representations. That's the section heading to comments 14 through 17 to rule um, 1.7, or um, throughout the language of the comments themselves and sometimes the model rules, it will refer to these with this clumsy word that my spell checker doesn't like, non-consentable, non-consentable conflicts. And it's the ABA spells that without a hyphen, by the way. So here's comment 14 to rule 1.7. Ordinarily, clients may consent to the representation notwithstanding a conflict. If you don't understand that first sentence, you need to stop and review and make sure that you understand 1.7b, which are, it explains this situation that even when there is a conflict, the lawyer can disclose it, explain the conflict to the client, and if the client doesn't care, they can give informed consent confirmed in writing to the lawyer. But 1.7b has, has um, two situations. But if it's otherwise prohibited by law, you can't do it. And if it's a non-consentable, an extreme, certain type of extreme scenario, I call the sitcom scenario. So make sure you understand that first sentence. Now, however, as indicated in paragraph B, some conflicts are non-consentable meaning that the lawyer involved cannot properly ask um, uh, for such agreement or provide representation on the basis of the client's consent. And when the lawyer is representing more than one client, the question of consentability must be resolved as to each client. In other words, if one of your clients is a client who could consent to a conflict of interest, but the other could not, then it's a non-consentable conflict, right? Both of the clients or all of the clients involved in this conflict have to be legally able to sign off on this. Consentability, uh, what an awkward word, is typically determined by considering whether the interests of the clients will be adequately protected if the clients are permitted um, to give their informed consent to the representation burdening a conflict of interest. So thus, under paragraph B1, representation is prohibited if in the circumstance, uh, circumstances the lawyer cannot reasonably conclude that the lawyer would be able to provide competent and diligent representation. And that gives a cite to the competence rule and the diligence rule, 1.1 and 1.3. Um, so please note under, um, uh, under 1.7B, um, there, you're going to have certain extreme situations where it, even though it's not the sitcom scenario, it's the, the conflict is so obvious that in hindsight, we think that you should never have asked the clients to consent to it. And even though they did consent to it, um, we're going to still consider you subject to discipline. And then B2 describes uh, uh, conflicts that are non-consentable because they're otherwise prohibited by applicable law. In earlier lectures, I said we would get around to explaining what this is, and this is where we do. It, for example, some states have, in some states, substantive law, and this can be a statute or a decision by the state Supreme Court, so a judicial holding, a precedent, or a statute, um, that in um, a, the same lawyer may not represent more than one defendant in a capital murder case, even with the consent of the clients. And so, and also under federal criminal statutes, certain representations by former government lawyers are prohibited despite the informed consent of the former client. Um, and so uh, be aware that we have a number of statutes for government lawyers and a lot of statutes about just government officials in general against them having conflicts of interest when they go to the public sector, when they leave the public sector, government sector and go to the private sector um, that limit their ability to get contracts and things like that. And that can apply to you as a lawyer. 
I want to talk about the, the capital punishment case. In some jurisdictions, they've decided that the stakes are so high, right? Some people's lives are on the line when they're charged with capital murder and they're facing the death penalty that even though in some cases we would let a lawyer uh, represent two criminal defendants in the same case, bad idea, but sometimes it, it, it's an access to justice issue where they can afford that. Um, but we may say, no, no, you can't do that in a capital case. In murder, if people are facing the death penalty, each defendant gets their own lawyer. And so this isn't a rule in every jurisdiction, don't get me wrong, but some states do have that kind of rule. And that's the type of thing that we're talking about. Your state may have a rule that in certain circumstances, um, uh, each uh, party gets one, has a different lawyer and, and there's no sharing of lawyers by co-defendants, let's say. Could happen, and if so, it doesn't matter if they consent. Okay, B3 describes conflicts that are non-consentable. This is the sitcom scenario because of the institutional interest and vigorous development of each client's position when the clients are aligned directly against each other in the same litigation or other proceeding. And now, so what we're really talking about, I call it the sitcom scenario because I've seen this on The Simpsons and Arrested Development and things like that, where you have a lawyer who's basically trying to represent the plaintiffs and the defendants in the same case and running back and forth between the tables um, it, 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 during the trial. And it's a very silly, it, it's a funny sitcom plot but you can't do that. And you can't do it even if the two parties say, we want this, so we both love this lawyer and, um, and we're fine with this and so forth. We've decided that um, that's a non-consentable conflict. And so you can't do that. Now that um, um, scenario as I've described it is extreme and may sound clear, but keep in mind that then we're gonna have some variations on this um, scenario that get less clear and so it, we may have to look at the context of the proceeding um, to decide whether the two parties are really adverse. And so, um, so you could have a scenario where um, it's a little unclear, for example, if they have different claims and maybe seemingly mutual um, uh, uh, claims, uh, exactly when do they become opposing parties and so forth. And again, in the law school classroom, we tend to present these as clear cut issues. In practice, you're going to see that sometimes um, they're not. And so that concludes this short lecture.